You are listening to a recording from the Cooperating to Build a Better Nova Scotia Conference in Halifax, a celebration marking the United Nations International Year of Cooperatives. I'm Robert Jeans. I'm with the Granary Food Co-op in Halifax. We're a small um, member-run food cooperative, as most co-ops are certainly member-constituted. Um, I've got a couple of buttons here from our organization that uh, I'll pass around and people can certainly take one if you have friends, family members who maybe like to have buttons and things. I only have six of them, but uh, so if you don't need one. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm not 100% certain what everyone's sort of um, knowledge of cooperatives and the different types of cooperatives, perhaps you're all you know, seasoned experts in your various cooperatives, um, or perhaps you're a student and uh, a little bit new to, um, to different kinds of cooperatives. But one of the things that I've certainly found in, um, in being a member of cooperatives for a couple of decades is that um, there's a whole variety of cooperatives which seem to um, serve different purposes, different types of businesses that they're involved in or, um, and, that are run in different ways. And the Granary Food Co-op is a very particular type of food co-op, probably like every, every co-op. You know, it's a very particular type of co-op. So I'll tell you a bit about our, our story. Um, you probably have some idea about, um, you know, what, a, what a, a small food co-op is all about. You probably think it's like a hippie food co-op type thing. Maybe that's what jumps into your head. Well, in our case, that's pretty much true. Um, <laughs> we, uh, our co-op has been running since uh, 1998. That's when we, we first started to work on it. And within three years, we had saved up the money to open a storefront. A small group of people in the city of Halifax, a lot of us were, were young people. Um, there were certainly some seniors involved as well. So, um, but you know, we, we were asking ourselves the question, hey, where's the hippie food co-op in Halifax, right? The hippies failed to leave us a food co-op <laughs> institution. And we just, um, you know, we found some, some books, you know, that were printed in the 1970s, how to start a food co-op, things like that. And uh, we thought, hey, we can do this. And um, so for the price of $250, we were able to order um, a, uh, a load of grain from Spearville Flour Mill, which is a, a grain processor in New Brunswick. And that got us started and we took our first load of uh, grain, which we packaged up and we took it to the Halifax Farmers Market and we began to make money. Um, we knew what we wanted to do. We knew we wanted to create a food co-op store in Halifax. Um, it took us three years to save up the money to open the store, but we did it. And uh, when we opened the store, we attracted more interested people in the community who wanted to join in. Now, um, probably a lot of, you know, a lot of you probably maybe have the idea that it's difficult to sustain a business. It is. It's probably more difficult to sustain a cooperative because in a business, the control of the business is often centralized in very few hands and the decision making is is centralized in very few hands. The managerial style and uh, approaches are centralized in very few hands. In a co-op, we elect a, a, a seven-member board of directors every, each year, as I'm sure in many of your co-ops you do similarly. And um, certainly our members can, can run to be on the board of directors, and uh, so we have a changing cast of well, a board of directors is actually the governance of your organization, but in our organization, because we're so small, we're actually also the management and, the, and to a large extent, the labor in our co-op. And the truth of the matter is, is that we, um, as a small um, hippie food co-op that has been running for 14 years on a Grigola Street in Halifax, that we, we continue to struggle. Um, we went through a period where, you know, we made money, we lost money, we lost members, Somehow the two seemed to go uh, hand in hand. Um, and then we revived our efforts and we, we made money again. So, you know, we're currently quite solvent in terms of, of, of money, but um, I would say we're still struggling in terms of um, our ability to manage our business and to, um, to grow it, stabilize it, and, uh, and sort of 
be in a position where we f can feel confident that our business is stable and sustainable. Um, <clears throat> but all the same, despite the, uh, the challenges of certainly running our small um, retail food co-op in Halifax, we've also had some successes and partly due to our, our smallness, we're able to, um, to innovate, we're able to change direction, we're able to capitalize on um, niche opportunities and niches that arise. And we've had a few of our um, successes that we've um, capitalized on. Initially, when we came into as a hippie food co-op of sorts, we, um, we specialized in selling organic, um, organic food, organic grain. Um, and that worked well for quite a while. And the market uh, developed a real interest in local food uh, that was evident. And we were able to easily work with um, small-scale providers in um, Nova Scotia. And, um, and in the early days when we were you know, doing organic, carrying organic food, we, it was an area that the, uh, the big retailers, the big distributors like Superstore and Sobeys, they weren't really into organic food because it was a niche, a niche area. By the, by the middle of the, the 2000s, the, um, the focus in food interest, certainly in, in many areas, I think, uh, was moving towards local food. And again, we were in a great position to, um, to plug in with local producers. The thing about local producers is often, like us, they're small scale. They may be a small scale farmer, a cottage industry with a new product, um, but we're able to work with um, with producers like that, and we're able to get those products onto our, our shelves and, and build relationships. A lot of these producers, whether it's farmers who have seasonal product or um, small uh, producers, they're unable to work with or an organization like Sobeys or Superstore who demands year-round and 100% you know, reliable week-in, week-out um, uh, product. So, you know, we've had, we've had successes by positioning ourselves as a small co-op to work with small um, local food producers. Uh, we've, we've been a good fit in that way. The other innovation that, we, that we've certainly pioneered in Halifax is the community-supported agriculture um, model, which is a relationship with farmers, um, whereby the farmer grows their vegetables, their fruit, their meat, whatever it is, and that they undertake a, a more direct relationship with their customers, but, but being an urban co-op, we're in a good position to uh, mediate their distribution with, um, with their customers. Now on the surface of it, it seemed like, well, you know, how do you make money off of that? But we found we were in a position where we weren't always able to manage things like produce. Produce is a, it's highly perishable, it takes a lot of work. We did a lot better managing shelf-stable products like grain, things in packages and bottles. So we developed the relationship with, um, with small farmers to do this community-supported agriculture model whereby they would br um, bring in their boxes of food to their subscriber customers and the granary, the, the local co-op, would be the distribution uh, location. And that really you know, energized our co-op and we sort of had you know, knock-on effects that contributed to our business success. Um, and you know, we feel good about, about that as an innovation. So you know, the thing about being a small co-op is that it's, it's given us the opportunity to, to, be, to be agile and to respond to, to changes in the market. Um, the other thing about our, our co-op is in that it, it has, can, through its 12 years, um, we have very seldomly actually had paid members. We've occasionally hired people to, um, to work on specific projects, but in actual, in terms of running the business, we're fairly unique for this area, and there's only probably, there's under 100 co-ops in North America that, prob that run with, predominantly with volunteer member labor, and we're one of those kinds of co-ops, and that, that's, a, um, that's a, a large struggle in and of itself. You know, I mean, like any co-op, I think we could all sit at the table and talk about our struggles. We could also talk about our successes, right? They go hand in hand. There's, there are two sides of the, of the coin. Um, but we've, 
you know, as a, as a co-op that's run predominantly on member-contributed labor, um, we've always known that we were a, um, a learning lab and an, and an, an incubator for, for ideas, for interest in cooperatives. And, um, you know, we've felt that we've, uh, one of our successes has been in giving new cooperators the, oppor uh, the opportunity to experience what it's like to be in a cooperative to, under, to learn about the sector and to actually get hands-on in, in the actual running of a cooperative business, whether it's you know, through governance in the, on the board of directors or carrying out the tasks of running our business. And we think that's been another successful aspect of, um, of our cooperative, um, of our history or our experience. Um, so, you know, we've, we have a business that we break even, we're in the black. Um, we're not certainly, um, we're not generating capital returns that would allow us to expand or even hire staff on a permanent basis. So we still have our struggles and we still have our successes. But um, we feel, you know, from the very beginning through the, the founding members our, with our interest in cooperatives, we wanted to you know, we'd read the books about the Anaganish movement. We'd read the, um, the books about the hippie food co-ops. We wanted to put the rubber to the road and actually start doing it. And we did start doing it, and we've been doing it for 14 years. And, um, you know, our members, some of them come and some of them go. I, I took a five-year break from the granary myself when my daughter came along, but once she uh, became school age, hey, I was right back into it because it's fun, it's social, it's uh, creative. It's entrepreneurial. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot to uh, you know recommend being involved in a, in a co-op, as as I know most of you would know as as fellow cooperators. So um, you know, but our struggle at this time is that to a certain extent we're undercapitalized, and to a certain extent we're undermanaged, and um, you know, but we we continue to to strive and. Uh, we're open for business five days a week, five hours a day. So um, we're at 2385 Agrigola Street. If you're in Halifax, feel free to stop by and, uh, and check it out. And we have a poster downstairs that you might see. And you're at Seaport Market. On we Saturdays. are at Seaport Market on Saturdays, yes. yes. Can you just tell me a couple of products, types of products? Yep. Because when you say grain, for me, I used to give grain to my horse. But a grain mm -hmm. is, for me, it's flowers, and the yep. way which I can... Uh, Bake. Yep. So do you sell flowers, or do I have to to, to, to use the grain and transform it in flour? Yeah, I don't have the equipment. Sorry, I'm saying because you're talking sure. about grain. So I'm well, sure. the thing is, uh, you know, a lot of it, <laughs> whether it's, um, you know, our initial, one of our substantial focus is local food, and certainly we carry local flour. Uh, we carry um, local wheat in, uh, we're sort of in the health food sector, right? Whereby it may be whole grain that needs to be ground. Some people have home grinders. Um, it can be rice, it can be lentils, um, it can be, uh, you know, there's bake, we, a bakery supplies us. So it's sort of like a health food store, really, is what it is. And, uh, you know, I think it's a bit of a, you know, an archetype of uh, North American food co-ops, you know, the, uh, the bulk food bin type um, food co-op, and that's pretty much what, what we look like. We also have packaged product as well. We work with Just Us. Um, we carry, you know, Just Us products, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, fair trade sugar. So a lot of people who actually like to cook, we're sort of plugged into the, the foodie movement yeah. in Halifax. You know, if we were a rural co-op, we'd be doing something completely different. But as an urban co-op, it's all about, we're, we're a distributive co-op, right? It's like we try to make connections and, um, and provide, you know, the, the food to consumers in, 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 the, in a city. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, and, Anyone I'm, and I'm sure we're going to have uh, lots of time to discuss after all presenters are done. But if anybody does have burning questions for Robert, because sometimes you have questions and he forgets yes. our calendar. This was this one, but I, I missed the beginning. I'm sorry. I missed yeah. the beginning. But um, are, are you able to replenish the membership when you become a volunteer? Uh, yes, we are, actually. Is there an age still an age There's spread? A, there's a range. <laughs> you know, when people have, if people have, People who have free time um, off, you know, those are great people to get involved in a co-op, right? Whether it's on the level of governance or 
in our case, you know, carrying out the day-to-day -day tasks. So, you know, seniors often, we have a, a group of seniors, you know, who people who are retired, they have free time. Um, students, often they have free time. Occasionally, at other times they don't, such as exam time. But, um, so, we, you know, you know, working people are able to certainly contribute. I work full time myself. Uh, I do my, you know, one evening a week at the co-op. Um, so, you know, th that's part of our struggle. We do have a struggle with uh, m membership, although we do have some long, very long term members as well. And uh, if you can keep a core group, you can usually sustain your uh, your cooperative. Thank you, Robert. Okay, um, thank you. So Linda's next. Linda Best is with FarmWorks, and uh, it's a, a relatively new initiative. It certainly hasn't been around for 14 years like the granary, but uh, it is no less innovative. And I'll let Linda talk about it, but uh, you also have a presentation, so I'm going to let you get set up there. Um, I can probably... So I have a question for you to think about just as, as you go through this. What's your vision for Nova Scotia? Because that's, um, uh, there's a little bit of sunshine there in Nova Scotia and, and that's, that's sort of where we started. We have, uh, we live in a wonderful province. We've got all kinds of, of benefits here not all of them being um, uh, appropriately um, not all of them uh, being ap appropriately used and um, my background is I grew up on a farm but I spent a lot of time uh, at the QE2 the last number of years doing uh, medical research. And then I was on the board of Capital Health and we helped to build that, uh, that first board in 2000, or the new board at the newly constituted um, districts in 2001. And every month we saw those charts with the lines going in the wrong direction. And so we are what we eat. And we all have a pretty good idea what we're eating. We are what we earn in order to eat, and we all know what those statistics are here in Nova Scotia. We see what's happening with the rural areas of Nova Scotia. We know that we have the means to make some, dif make some changes by making careful choices as to what, what we eat. So a group of people uh, eight of us initially came together and started talking about healthy farms, healthy food, and uh, building on our, our vision for our capital health, which was healthy people, healthy communities. And back in 2009, I helped to put together a, a session at uh, the Old O in uh, Greenwich bringing the people and the pieces together. That's what we're still doing. And we, we can't look at our future in isolation. We can't look just at the farmers, the food producers, the distributors, the eaters, the investors. We've got to bring all of us together. This has got to be holistic. We've been in, it's so interesting that so many of our uh, terminologies come from farming, such as the silos that we've been in for so long. So let's break down. I even tried to find a cartoon of how of silos falling over, but I didn't. I didn't <laughs> find one. Money invested in food production in Nova Scotia is an investment in the economy, health, rural areas, communities, culture, and the environment. Because it doesn't matter what you what you look at, 
food is a key part of it. If you're talking about um, uh, tourism, about the loss of the boat, uh, any of these things that have that impact Nova Scotia, there's a, a huge part of it has to do with food. And for example, right now, um, well, in 2004, there was this wonderful long document about culinary tourism in Nova Scotia. Where is it? You can't, you can't even find it. I have it bookmarked, but you can't even find it online anymore. And all kinds of wonderful stuff. Well, we should be going there. We have basically clean air, clean water, the ability to produce wonderful food, and we have less than 4,000 farmers left. And 70% of them clear under, or, or gross under 50,000 a year. So, we set ourselves up as a cooperative because we have to do this together. Jen Scott, we're near the tipping point. But we can take steps now to recreate a local, sustainable, healthy food system that gives our farmers the livelihood they deserve and provides reliable, healthy food to our families. And as we know, this is the, the World Bank here, uh, uh, quoted here, but it's from the uh, UN Environmental Agency. Um, food needs are projected to increase by 70% <coughs> when the global population reaches 9 billion. Temperatures, water demand, uh, rainfall, all of those things that, that we are seeing and, and, and com accompanied with um, um, the loss of land, the loss of productivity. So major external challenges. And we, all the climate regions have upward, this is winter trend, but it, um, it applies year round. Mackenzie District, for example, 4.9. And of course, you know what the impact that has on us. The, the good news, however, is that Laurentian current, good news only for us, the Laurentian current coming down along the, the, the um, east coast is helping to moderate our temperature so that, in fact, ours is only increased by 0 0.5 when, when you look at it relative to other parts. So that's a challenge and an opportunity for us here. Look at what's happened to the rural areas of Nova Scotia. And Cape Breton and, and the North Shore and the Annapolis Valley, all those areas of Nova Scotia, we can be growing food. We can be, uh, whether it's private enterprise or cooperatives, those figures that, uh, that George is giving us, um, there's huge potential for us to do, um, to, to make this into the breadbasket, not only for ourselves, but for, I guess, wheat is <laughs> breadbasket. And then, of course, the, the, the health related. This is from Oregon because it summarized better than any I could find locally of uh, we are what we eat. All of the, um, the f according to the CDC, food related chronic diseases account for 60% of health care uh, spending in the United States. Production has decreased. When I was a kid, many long years ago, 60% of our food was, was produced here in Nova Scotia. Now, if you take out uh, dairy, eggs, chicken, you're, we're down to five, six, eight percent Red meat, 2%. The rest is imported. Despite XL and Capital today, just the announcement of the listeria, um, uh, pork, 1%. Four and five years ago, we lost 60 hog producers in Nova Scotia, and you can imagine what that cost our, our rural economy. Um, milk and eggs and chicken, we're at 50 to, to 90%, and with, uh, now with East Coast uh, uh, Sustainable, East Coast Organic, hopefully the, the milk will, will increase even above that. 
crops, apples. We're $13 million worth of apples when, when we're sending about uh, 13, well, about 12 out and bringing back about 30. You know, it's, a, it's ludicrous. It's like the story of the, the apples picked into bins in England, shipped to China, polished, wrapped in paper, and shipped back to England. So, and every time, every, every piece of food that we bring into Nova Scotia that we could be growing here, there's an ele electronic transmission that takes the, the money out of the, out of the provincial economy. So strategies are needed to reverse that trend. Production has been a cornerstone increase in food sufficiency and security, and I didn't bother to put up the chart that showed that we were just at the peak of the Soros cycle, which happened at the time of the Great Saxby Gale, and I didn't bother to show any of the slides that, that you can't easily find on the web from a meeting in March in Moncton that showed that we are uh, about, um, about one storm surge sandy size away from Nova Scotia being an island. And as, as uh, uh, Dr. Ann Clark uh, said the other day, using Jen Scott's um, words, we're at the end of that conveyor belt. If we think we're at the end, uh, Newfoundland is even further down the road. And we have, according to EMO, three days supply of fresh produ product in Nova Scotia and about 14 days of canned and, and uh, packaged. And uh, yes, we see that there's more uh, oil being found and gas and so on and so forth, but still it's a finite resource and we should not be using it up. We need to leave it to build the infrastructure for green energy and for our kids. As a, as a medical person, I know that if we suddenly took all of the oil out of uh, the healthcare system, we wouldn't have it. Whether it's antibiotics or artificial hip, hips, we'd be, we'd be in big trouble. And agritour, yeah, it, we, don't, we don't tend to think, you can't even have a Band-Aid because it's made with uh, if one of the best renewable resources that we have in Nova Scotia is culinary and agritourism and tourism in general. If I had my druthers, everybody who's leaving the province would be required to spend one less day outside the province. Think what that would do for our economy. So the availability of healthy food is becoming crucial in light of global and local issues. So. This group of people, uh, the ones at the top, were there from the beginning, um, got together to how can we do, what can we do? Something's got to be done. We've, we've talked about it, we've studied it, we know what the issues are. So, we were joined over time, uh, starting with uh, Jeff and Thomas Krauss were two of the first people I talked to, Jeff Moore. And all of these other people either were there from the beginning or have come on board to help us. And they, they have a number of different roles. Some of them helped us to put ourselves together in, in with, with governance and, and how we should do this. Some of them help us uh, on an ongoing basis uh, as we figure out. Uh, I just spoke to Jonathan downstairs and said, We've got one particular potential, pot potential client that we're really concerned about. Uh, can you spend some time with us before we go back to talk to him? And others we will call on, such as Susan Carroll. We have somebody we're funding who, who is uh, producing food. So she went to talk to Susan uh, to get the information. So, other than Deborah and myself, how many of you are familiar with, the, and, and you now, of course, <laughs> as well, uh, with the CEDIF program? How many of you have shares in any CEDIF? Good. Um, it's an un, uh, unexploited resource. We have over, Nova Scotians have over $200 billion invested outside the province that are helping to grow other people's economies. The program's been around for a while. 
And the good news is that just in last, just last year, um, 7.5 million in 14 uh, current in existing and new CEDAs. So now we're up to a total of 50 million in 51. But you know what? In the next four years, I want to see that quadrupled. Let's bring that money back and, and, and have it working for us here in Nova Scotia. The government can't do it. The first thing they have to pay out of their $9.3 billion last year was $883 million to pay the interest on the debt, and that's at low interest cost. So if we were paying uh, uh, 1990s interest charges, that would be double. And so you look at, at my field, health, $3.7 billion out of the 9.3 total. And you get down here, and here's agriculture. They had 64 million to put into agriculture, and m most of that is for jobs and and pre-existing um, uh, grant structures, agri-invest, and so on and so forth. So, um, so we 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 can find the money. We've got to find it in our own pockets. And and uh, I have uh, I, I I'm. I'm probably spending more time promoting the CDF than I actually am pr promoting uh, farm work. Um, as, uh, because we are um, uh, cooperative shareholders, of course, uh, play a major role in this, but not so much yet because of the fact that we're just getting started. So we've only had one AGM, and um, so the people who have had the most input at this point are the board members. This pleased me to see this the other day in uh, Jim Morton's weekly update. So it's time for community members to start thinking about making a smart investment that's good for business, good for the community, and good for the investor. So needless to say, that's on, will now be on all of my uh, information. So we provide the means for strategic community investment in food production and distribution in order to help increase access to a sustainable local food supply for all Nova Scotians. So that's our mission. We promote investing locally and buying local food because if we're going to help to raise all boats, even though we don't uh, invest in fisheries, um, then it, it, it makes sense to promote uh, local food uh, uh, generally. And that's why I asked you, what is your vision? Because we, we have to change the mindset. We have to get people thinking about how they can, whether it's a hundred dollar share in FarmWorks or, or uh, helping the, the granary co-op or making sure that they buy Just Us coffee or any of the other initiatives, particularly in our case around food, but I, I don't care if it's housing or whatever, we have to start thinking about the benefits that we have here in Nova Scotia and how we can augment those by working cooperatively. So last fall we started, uh, uh, we had a couple meetings before Christmas, but in January and February, 22 meetings around, around the province and and thanks perhaps in part to climate change. We had great weather and we enjoyed our travel. <laughs> and so we raised that amount and we'll, we'll be starting our second offer shortly. Food grows here. Every time I have the opportunity, I talk about the fact that food grows here. Continuing to build awareness of the pos positive impacts for the people that we're investing in, there's a preliminary application, confidentiality, business plan, review, board decision. We give them the money, 6% interest this year. It, it may change next year. We'll, we'll make that decision each year at, uh, on, on an ongoing basis. Um, there's the annual financial statements. And we are continually in contact with the people that, that, that we're funding. Um, we're mentoring them, we're asking how they're doing, we're supporting them. Uh, for example, one of the businesses, we've just come up with three different uh, uh, events that they want them to participate in. And these are some of the people that uh, 
uh, there's a couple board members here, uh, Ann Anderson, Allison Scott Butler, Stephen uh, Anderson, no relation, and, and the rest of those are people that we have invested in. And uh, we've been having great fun watching Jeremy uh, White up in uh, Nyanza uh, build his building. Our share of it was very small, but, um, but it wouldn't have happened perhaps quite as soon had we not been part of it. And down there in the uh, meeting the other night um, of the, uh, the dragons, uh, one of our three, this fall, three gentle dragons den. So we, and out of that, just by the by, we had uh, 15 applications, and some of them would be ready to go out the gate right now if we had the money. We've used up uh, 205,000 of our two. We, of the 223, we've already brought some back in. We have about 118. Uh, speaking of volunteers, uh, I am a volunteer. Um, this has to get off the, uh, out the gate. This has to work well. So it's, it's, there's a lot of my money and, and energy going into it at this point. Once we get a million dollars under administration, then we'll be able to have somebody actually do the the administrative work, but it's it's a, it's a it's a it is a huge commitment, but it's very rewarding because every time I talk to one of the people that we funded, and when I talk to the people, well, I I got um, I, we got involved with the Blockhouse School, um, which I see as a prototype going forward for rebuilding community. It's an old school. So I got an application the other night. They'd like to have 50,000 right off the bat so they could put this, this wonderful uh, solar collector on the roof. And uh, so hopefully, with our help, they will get, they get the money to do that. So thank you. I think I've covered it. I really hope that the CEDIF in, in Nova Scotia uh, uh, are a success and perform well. And I know they're moving now to, to PEI. We are pushing, we some people in New Brunswick, for New Brunswick to adopt it. We've, been, been, uh, we've invited twice a government official from Nova Scotia to come to speak to our people. Our Minister of Finance is, is a former VP from Irving. Uh, which tells you how completely freaking ignorant he is about <laughs> anything uh, having to do with that. And uh, the answer is that they gave us is that they think this is risky uh, and that they're not sure that they want to give any more tax credit. Like they give already tax credit to everybody and the sisters, but uh, not, not to see it. Uh, and uh, I think the only way that they're going to change is if they see year after year that you are successful with these set of here. Uh, because that's the only, you know, ration, you know, rationality doesn't seem to work on them, forget about it. But, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the envy, of, you know, versus what's happening to another province might work. So I'm just praying for that. I, I did forget one thing. I missed the slide there that, um, as you know, um, the first, you invest for five years and you get a 35% income tax credit. And if you leave it in for another five, you get an additional 20 and another five, an additional 10. So there's 65%. If there's a failure, which will not happen in our case, um, they're, they're, the government picks up the bottom 20 in addition to that. But also if you're at the 30 or 40 or above uh, a tax um, bracket, and you put your money in to an RSP as well. If you invest, if you're in a forty thousand tax bracket and you invest ten thousand dollars over fifteen years, you will have uh, ten thousand three hundred seventy-five in tax credits. Plus, you'll have your initial investment. Now, of course, on the offering document, we are not allowed to tell anybody that we will give them a dividend. We are not allowed to tell them that we will preserve their capital. It is crucial that we do both. So we are going to make sure that after three years, people get at least a 1% to 2% uh, dividend. And that, that struck me one day. I was listening to Kevin 
O'Leary on the Dragon Stand. He said, my mother told me never to invest in anything if there wasn't a dividend. So <laughs> <laughs> the dividend is, is as Irina and I were uh, discussing, there's huge dividends. The, the social uh, aspects of this, the, the, the fact that we, s we went to Yarmouth in January, and the people who came into the room like this, who left like this, you know, that's a dividend that, that brings out the goosebumps, and I, as, I, as I talk about it even now. So it's, it's, it's uh, a winning solution all the way around. And the fact that we are, that we are uh, reinvesting all, as that money, as of March, we'll have uh, almost 5,000 coming back in every month. So that gets to go back out again. So it's, um, it's, it's, there's one little proviso. The, the PEI so far, has their Securities Commission is causing them to use only equity. NS allows us to do uh, subordinate debt. I wouldn't be happy trying to pick winners to that extent. If we're, if we're investing in somebody, and, and we're getting some of our money. If three years down the road they have a year that they can't pay us well, then, then uh, we can deal with that. But to try and pick a company that's going to be able to, it's not going to be in a growth phase or whatever in five years or the ten years, um, that, that makes me nervous. However, that said, I've also, um, I've been talking to people in Ontario I'm making sure we are present. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. 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 For having us come and speak about uh, this topic of food, which um, which I have to say for just us is, you know, I mean, it's coffee. So do you need coffee? Not really. So we never really thought of ourselves as really in the food movement. We sort of thought we created really good coffee. More what we were about was sort of the ethics of purchasing. So that was sort of what we wanted to get into was to to work with producers to be able to pay a fair price and to be able to, so we were really able to take their product, treat it with the respect that they had, and be able to put it out on the market. And the, the overriding uh, uh, mission of Just Us was to connect the consumers to the producers. And, and, so, uh, and so we've chugged along with that for the last number of years. It was really important to us because the producers in our producing countries formed into co-ops. That was how they were able to deal with the, a lot of the stuff that, that we've heard from Robert and Linda today that was happening in, in their countries, um, when they organized into cooperatives, they all of a sudden, of course, had strength and they were, be able, were able to change the trade system uh, that, had, uh, that had put them into poverty and oppression for many, many years. And so it was, uh, so it's been, so for us it was really important that we start as a co-op because we felt it was, uh, it was sort of in solidarity. Um, we began to realize we talked the same language. We just had a general manager visiting from Peru, and uh, and we have exactly the same struggles. Like we're talking exactly the same language. You know what he's dealing with, I'm dealing with. It's sort of a co-op is a co-op is a co-op. And when I hear you know Robert's stories, I'm going like this. Yeah, yeah, I get all that. You know, it's nothing to do with volunteer. It's like it's the exact same things whether you're paying people or you're volunteering. It's the all the same issues that we have in a co-op and and. Um, and so I, th so for for us, it's uh, it's been a, a really exciting and uh, and uh, challenging journey um, to to figure out the whole um, or to believe in ourselves that we could actually change the way things are. And uh, and what I see in Nova Scotia, and, and Linda is definitely one of my inspirations around this whole food movement. And when you hear her, you can see her her depth of knowledge and her she inspires me every time I hear. Her. Um, and I learn something new every time because I think what 
what Just Us came to about two or three years ago, we were, we were being asked to speak at a lot of agricultural things. And we were sort of like, why are the agricultural communities here asking us to speak? And as we begun to educate ourselves, we begun to see that many of the same issues that were being faced with our producers are being faced here in Nova Scotia. And, and they're looking for a different trade model, a different way of, of, uh, of being able to get their products to market and to be able to uh, be able to be paid a fair price. And, um, and so most recently, um, in our last strategic plan, we decided that we would, we would make fair trade part of this, but that fair trade wasn't going to be our narrow focus, but that we were going to put ourselves fully in the food movement and, and begin to realize that we maybe, we didn't have any answers, but we had sort of figured out a model of business that, that works and that we have, and we've learned a lot about governance, about how to run co-ops, not to pretend we don't have a thousand other, that creates more problems, but we, we have figured out something that, uh, that has allowed our co-op to, uh, to be able to be a successful business and yet to have a social mission. And so I think that's the, the challenge for, for us as we go forward is, is that we're not following that typical uh, capitalist model of being profit driven. And so, you know, we use the tagline, people on the planet before profits. And so we, we, we believe that, that all three, and there's, pro there's more components even than that, but the basics are those three need to all be addressed at the same time. And somehow we've proven that we can, we can do that and we can have investors and pay them dividends and we can pay the staff a decent salary and we can pay the producers uh, a fair um, compensation for the work that they're doing. And, uh, and we can get fantastic products. You know, I think that's what the most important thing for us as consumers. And so, uh, so just us, when we sort of made that transition, one of the things that we decided to get involved with was the, the organic milk. Where we live, there happened to be an organic milk producer. And uh, he you know, came to us, sort of been doing organic milk for, I don't know how long Herman's been doing it, for 22 years or something. And, frustrated that we can't get that to market as organic milk and so came to talk to us and that's what just us I think has ended up you know we've spawned a lot of co-ops because people come and they see what you can do as a co-op as we see with the granary and with other co-ops that have started in in the valley um, that we can do something like that so eco milk we began to work with them around kind of the cooperative side around sort of how do you get things to market how do you get a fair price charge da, 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 da. and so through that you know, we've learned so much about sort of our food in Nova Scotia and learned so much about the challenges. I mean, it literally has been 10 years to birth EcoMilk. And I think, I don't know how many years of that, many years of that was fighting with the dairy boards. I mean, it was, you know, and fighting with transportation and fighting with, with just a system that doesn't support, you know, the type of agriculture that many of us would like to see. And, and uh, Anyway, you know, we have birthed it, but is it, is it secure? No. Is it, uh, you know, it's, it's priced quite high on the market. Everybody's sort of saying, eh, you know, it's really expensive. It's like, you know, and I mean, I said to somebody the other day, and who do you think's getting rich? I mean, it's like, you know, this is the cost, you know, the way, because we're fighting against a system that doesn't support this kind of agriculture. So we're trying to do it in the real, in the, the typical system. And of course it ends up costing way money because who's making the money? Farmers and the trucking people. I mean, it's the trucking people really that are making the money, uh, not the farmers and not the, because that's what our system, how our system is set up here. And it was interesting, we were listening to, to Ann Clark and uh, I found it fascinating because she was saying that, that the policies that we have in Nova Scotia were actually quite successful because we're set up to export to the motherland and we do really good at that. And so we need to change the policies to be able to say that we're not an export, but that we're growing for ourselves and we need to create the systems that are gonna allow that to happen. The other thing I think that, uh, that, that Just Us has, is working on or just broke ground on is that we're, we're building a center for small farms. And so we're also, so we're sort of trying to take kind of what we've done or been somewhat successful at and create kind of that incubation or that place where we can just 
using the cooperative model to just get people in the room. You know, let's start talking. Let's start dreaming. Let's start, you know, as, as Linda said, what do you want for Atlantic Canada? Because you know what? It's completely in your control. There is nobody out there doing anything to you. I mean, we can have what we want in Nova Scotia. And so somehow as Nova Scotians, we have to start to believe that and start to... So that's what we're hoping to be able to do at this centre, is to be able to start those dialogues and begin to empower people to say that, in fact, you know, and, and the, the method that fair trade used was this boycott. So it was about where do I spend my money? And, and we know that the capitalist system listens to that. So, you know, we came into the world with fair trade coffee. I mean, we were considered the hippies. We were like, you know, it was, you know, we, nobody knew how to brew the coffee. It was all weird. It was like, <laughs> you know, and it was like, but I mean, now, you know, I don't know a coffee company that isn't doing fair trade. I mean, it's just like, because as consumers, we bought the story. We, we wanted to, to do that. Uh, I just got this thing from David Suzuki, not David Suzuki, but it's the foundation, and, and saying 81% of people are willing, want the environment to change and are willing, don't, are willing to compromise the, the growth of the economy to do that. Like, it's like, so it's like that many people want this. So it's like, who's doing it to us? So we have to figure out kind of what are the blocks? Why can't we as people make the changes that we want to change? And, and I think there's a lot of people, as Linda's working with, you know, these, that there are people that are entrepreneurs that have really great ideas. And so how do we start to support those ideas? But I, I believe that, uh, what we believe at Just Us is that it, it has to be f grounded in a solid plan. It can't be, we don't, I don't want, I'm concerned about setting up young people in five years down the road, they're angry and mad and, and feeling like they've been exploited. And so we want to set them on really solid ground. And it's one of Linda's beliefs too, is that, you know, and, and we believe that when we started Just Us, that we, it had to be on solid ground. I can hear that from the greenery. And that's why you're around, you know, as long as you've been, because we had to figure out a way to do it that was based in reality and not just an airy fairy idea. So there we are. Just Us um, has been around for about 18 years, for those that don't know. Um, and we, we're mainly a maritime company. Uh, we do distribute across Canada, but primarily we're, we're in the Maritimes. And there's about 14 members at Just Us that are a part of the co-op and about 75 employees. And so our challenge right now is to try and grow that membership at Just Us. And, and it's not been easy. We've been sort of surprised. So this week we, uh, it seems it's mystifying to people. Even though they work in the co-op, it's kind of a whole mystery as to what is that membership thing. So today we, or yesterday, I think. I noticed the membership drive membership posters everywhere. signs. But <laughs> <laughs> Ten steps to membership. <laughs> it's not that difficult. It's not that mysterious. <laughs> and so that's what we're. Maybe we should call it a social share. Yes, I know. I know. It's funny. The, the I know. It's, a, it's an inter. I think it does. I think it does. Yeah, no, it's an interesting thing. Or we have the other side where they want to become a member with no investment, no anything. Like, why can't I just, like, it's a member of a club. And so it's, a, you know, so we get that too. It's like, well, no, you know, it's not quite that. And so, but it's also not onerous. So like, what is the balance there? And so we're, we're at Just Us, that's been one of our, our biggest challenges is to grow the membership. We've been this size for many years. <laughs> and people have come and go with that, but that's kind of been our base group. And, and uh, so I'm hoping that we can, uh, that we can change that and get more people in.